feature presentation. How do you um, arrange? Do you arrange only by uh, filmmaker? Do you arrange by genre and then filmmaker within the genre pool? Okay, so this is this is a this is a really interesting question to go into to start with because. <laughs> I usually go in alphabetical order, but because of the boutique labels kind of making a, a big move for physical media, I've really started to focus on um, certain labels. So on the other side of this wall is all Criterion. And so I've been deciding to put like Arrow together and actually talking about, you know, Oscilloscope uh, recently in, in sort of putting them together as well. library is incredible. They have always done such a solid job in putting together such incredible Blu-ray and DVD collections. You look at Madeline's Madeline or, you know, even more recently, Short Bus on 4K. There's so much there yeah. that like, for the film fans. Nice. You can really you can really build something. But that's an interesting organizational idea. Huh. I like that. Yeah, I didn't actually get it myself. It was from a podcast I listened to called Film Junk, and they kind of focus on uh, Blu-ray manifestos and things like that. And they go into like, you know, their their sort of own collections and obsessions. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, this is always a big conversation for me. And I'm starting to, because I got rid of, I've moved a lot. And then I got rid of a lot of my, I've kept a lot of my collector pieces, like the ones I knew would never get reissued or like fall out of being issued. So I've held on to those. So I have a, a small bit, but I want to start collecting again. Thinking about that, you know, sorry. I mean, we have a movie to talk about, but. No, no, no. I, I love this stuff. Like it's, it's always great knowing like, you know, if there's other physical media collectors out there because it doesn't seem like it's a, it's a big group anymore. It's very niche. So it's nice to know that, you know, a, a filmmaker like yourself, Rachel, really cares about collecting. Or are you asking movies. if I'm a nerd? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Sick. What about you, Dave? Are you are you a collector of physical media or anything in particular? Uh, you know, man, I just started. I, I don't want to be left behind. I, I'm not going to sit here and I'm not as um, well versed in film as both of you. But I did start collecting not that I wanted to. I threw a friend. I started collecting wrestling action figures and action figures. I have Jon Snow. I have Andre the Giant. I have Rocky. And I started collecting um, records. This is all in, and just like I have, I have Pee Wee Herman, I had Sonic, who I lost on the travel, which is sad. Um, sad. You know, sorry for Sonic. Sorry, and I loved Sonic as a kid. So yeah, I started collecting. I have uh, Moon Knight. Um, so yeah, it's like I start collecting all these, all these things. It's not now. Books. I'm not allowed huh? to buy books anymore because there's too many. It gets out of control. It's it's like it's part really of you is just like I have to keep buying, but then there's the rational side of you thinking like, okay, like where am I going to put all this stuff? Though. Yeah, I don't know about you, Dave, but it's like you start to like run out of place to put them, and you start putting them on places they probably shouldn't be, like your kitchen table, and you're like, now I don't oh, even yeah. have a kitchen table anymore. Look, look where the Moon Knight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying it's like then you're just like, oh yeah, I mean it makes sense. I'll just I'll just put it. I'll just keep them on my bed now because like you run out of surfaces and then you're just like, you don't even, you can even live in your own apartment because you've got all this crap. Crazy. crazy. That I you do. love and you'll never do anything, but keep, you're not going to get rid of them. No, I can't. I have Jon Snow when you enter the apartment because I want you to see who the king in the north is. You never yeah, gave so up I'm on Game of Thrones. <laughs> I did. I will not. <laughs> Jon Snow is the greatest character to ever exist, so... Well, actually, one of my questions about the film kind of relates to physical media in a way. Um, I was just curious about Robert's um, physical media in the film. And was that all found through the prop department or was some of that uh, personal memorabilia, whether it be the posters or the CDs, you know, hearing uh, the great late Julie Cruz's Mysteries of Love is such a wonderful moment in the film. Yeah. Well, Julie Cruz was in the script. That, that they put it on and then me and Ryan were like let's yes and this and let's just push let's let's cruise with cruise here and like push that volume way up as like a little nod to to you know Fran's mind her imagination like she, it's yeah the song's playing but then her mind takes over and like makes it the soundtrack of their moment you know because she just can't help her her, her imagination is so you know, firing off in that moment. So that was a fun, that feels like a fun collaborative beat, you know, between me and Ryan and the script of like, okay, yes, Julie Cruz and, you know, that was fun. Um, but all the other stuff 
was, you know, for clearances and stuff. It was stuff that uh, the art department made up. And I thought they did a great job. They found some great local artists to make posters. And we had a lot of fun coming up with like film titles, (laughs) (laughs) coming up with things, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, he needs to have like a, like an early aughts, like French romantic idiosyncratic film. And then we need like something that looks really Dutch from the nineties and like, like, you know, that's fun. And then like, if you have to be kind of a film lover, I guess, to come up with some of that stuff. What was your favorite title uh, that you came up with? Oh God, I, I knew you're going to ask me that. I, can't <laughs> I had to. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't watched the movie since we, we like finished it. Um, Cause I don't even, I didn't even watch the premiere in Sundance. So I haven't watched it in like a long time. So I don't, I don't remember the titles of the film. Cause I remember uh, departure being in the back, but I wasn't sure if that was based on the, departure, the Jersey that was a good one because movie. It just seems so nondescript, but you're like, of course it's an indie film. Um, but I love that. There was one that was like a foreign title that I think I liked a lot and I was really proud of us for, but I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was a French title. I can't remember what it was, but no, it's been a long time. It's been a couple of years actually now since I've watched it. Wow. That's yeah. It's one of those films though, that like lingers in your mind. And I think what the film does so beautifully is it articulates without having to say it, what it's like to be both lonely, but also enjoy the solitude of being alone. And that contradiction Mm -hmm. that people feel sometimes where they live a very certain certain way or lifestyle and then something interrupts it whether it be you know connecting with somebody or trying to figure out to be more sociable or just in in general you know the office kind of um sort of milieu i wanted to ask you rachel um because this is a script that you didn't work on and i wanted to know what it was like in terms of that process and coming into a production that the three writers had already developed a short Mm -hmm. and sort of what your process was in sort of contributing to that Yeah, you know, um, they have a theater background and so do I. And I think, you know, in theater, you're often direct. I mean, when I was first learning to direct or practicing directing or doing a directing practice when I was getting studying theater, which is where I started out like them, you're I mean, I didn't write Hamlet, you know, but I sure got to put it on stage or I didn't write Richard II. I didn't write Betrayal. I didn't write The Caretaker. I didn't write these things, right? Most of the time when you're directing theater, you're not directing things that you've written. And often you're directing things that are like hundreds of years old, where you you can't even have a conversation with the writers. So I was already ahead of the game. I had the writers who were generous and able to talk and wanting to talk and wanting to collaborate. And in fact, the script was written to me like a play and that there was there was just enough for us to know. There was such specificity in whatever words are on the script that I got so much out of it that there wasn't a ton of data in terms of there was no visual data, which was such an invitation. Um, and then there was so many spaces for, for me to make choices already on the script level. So there was so much specificity so I could immediately start churning creatively in terms of thinking about the tonal and atmospheric approaches and who Fran is and all that stuff. I'm firing off, getting all that good food. But then in equal measure, there's so much space for it felt for me. And that's such a rare invitation. Like I said, something I'm more used to from look reading a play. And so I, I think even from the page, there was this sense of, okay, we had very specific, we have a very specific thing we're, we built here, but it's built also to accommodate other people. And, and so that was, that it made it, I think, quite easy then to just spin off and make some dynamic choices and build visions and build worlds. And I, I felt complete permission to do that. Yeah, it plays a little bit like you're listening to radio. There's an audio dynamic to it where you could just listen to the voices of the characters interacting and sort of, you know, you're obviously watching Fran and like the first 13 minutes or so, Fran doesn't really say anything until Carol's retirement when Carol talks to her. So I found that really fascinating as well. Dave, I wanted to ask you what your initial thoughts were of Robert and did the script allow you to sort of, you know, imbue the character with emotional 
sort of approaches that maybe weren't just like one specific thing, because I always find, you know, the great thing when talking to actors, they love scripts that open them up in terms of interpretation to characters where they can play them in multiple ways and not just one specific way. Um, yeah, I mean, Rachel, we spoke, you know, before and we we kind of, I feel, developed the character, you know, together, like to the point where I was trying to figure out what kind of band he would like. <laughs> I think one day I just blurted it out. I think it was the Foo Fighters. <laughs> like, yo, <laughs> rock with you. I don't know why. It just, I was in Vancouver sitting in this, in the Airbnb and I was like, Foo Fighters. <laughs> just set up. <laughs> like, I'd worked like two months to figure that out. I was, but I had like, you know, I broke through, I went, I broke down the script like multiple times, had many notes. Um, you know, Rachel was like, he's, he's been divorced twice. So I developed the, the, the stories of, or how that went down in, in the city and why and it was a lot of motives. And I saw things in that character that I w wish I could be more like. And there's stuff that I I was like, I, I want to fix and like, you know, my own, you know, fumbles were relationships in real life. I think I I drew from that, you know, and I, I can feel for that. I was like, oh, this guy's struggling. And then this and then also when you get to it, when we got to Astoria living there for that three weeks or so, you start to I was I felt like I was I was there a month, dude, a month. Yeah, a month. Sorry, a month. Just like I was like, oh, I'm 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 eating clam chowder alone. He would do that. <laughs> and then watch a movie or something like that but yeah, yeah. I, I, like you come off so naturally in terms of the performance as well which you know like even the idea of you rambling about the raincoat and uh the umbrella it just feels so natural in terms of the performance and it's just delightful i wanted to quickly ask the two of you because we only have about two minutes left um specifically i was curious about how you know you just talked about the location did you guys actually shoot in the autumn and were there specific um areas that were written into the script like the columbia or the main office because they always talk about you know the window or you look out into the window and see you know the cruise ship or the crane lifting the gear that's all found there that's all informed by the space and that office was a empty vessel that we filled um and i I chose that location primarily because of those windows and looking out. I mean, just like it was, I, I, I tried to not lose my cool too much. And like that way they would maybe wouldn't ask for too much money, but I was just like, yeah, this will work inside. I was like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's incredible. It was perfect. It was, you can make so much tableau and you could have such relationship between like, cause the natural world is a relationship to the human world and where those things merge so a part of of the motifs that I was building that I was just like this is so great um and the script didn't stipulate what they did for a living so um we again that's an example of invention and so I was like okay they work here they work at a port authority office and that's what's happening and um you know all, all the locations and all of the, the those details of how the world uh, is seen was was from where we shot and and that's why I like to get to the location so early in prep so I can harvest. Does that also happen with storyboarding as well, where you're looking, do you storyboard? Oh, you don't. Because some of the, the images are so beautifully composed and it feels almost yeah. like that took forever to do. But I, I love that one shot that you come back to a few times of Daisy Ridley's Fran, where, you know, it's the sort of cutting off half of the face and and sort of looking at the lip and the fragmentations. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Fragmentations. We're in, uh, Dustin and I get a lot of our influence, of course, from cinema, but I would say our compositional um, grammar and um, uh, inspirations are often informed from uh, fine art as opposed to cinematic art. And there was a number of uh, photographers um, that we were looking at that play with with those with that fragmentation as a way of you know the piece of pieces of people in the world. Um, you know, that not only reflects some of the fragmentation within Fran and her relationship with the world around her, but it also heightened the sense of, of, of the detail, you know, how a gesture can say as much as language. Um, so that felt right. And, you know, no, no, Dustin and I, we do like a shot list, which we can either live by like a Bible or not. We always sense, like there's plenty of times where we just would find well i didn't dustin he's the genius but he he'd find 
you know, while, while they're improv in the office, we'd, ha we'd have to follow the same rigor of composition that we've been following, but he has such wonderful instincts and I, and you, you, we spend a lot of time in pre-shooting before principal, getting B-roll, finding these paintings, and that disciplines both of us to just be able to find, where's our film? That's our film, that's our film. That's often what we'll say is when we're trying to find that frame, at least that's what I say to myself, I can't speak for Dustin, but you know, he'll show me a frame and I'll go, that's the film, okay. And I think you just start to build like a sensibility that gets quicker and quicker in finding that frame. At least that's what I noticed in watching him as an artist. It felt like he could just find it, you know, the more we would, we would build. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll have a list. And, and when we build the list, it's a very private thing. And we are, um, it's a, it's a very important part of the process and we build that language together. Um, and then we speak with it. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate that even more than exposition where, you know, you're not telling the audience, you have to observe what's going on in the exposition body language. Is in the poison. It is. is poison. Absolute poison. And voiceovers as well. I find that they can be a little bit uh, uh, annoying after a while. I, I have to quickly uh, ask you two before I wrap up, uh, before going into this project, did you know that cottage cheese was actually a curd? Dave? And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I don't like cottage cheese, so I, I had no information. I was like, I just heard of it a long time ago, and I was like, this is uh, disgusting. <laughs> <No information. laughs> I didn't even want to. The texture is disturbing. I, I walked into been... this with no cottage cheese intel. <laughs> I had no, I, I, someone told me about cottage cheese, I heard it, and I removed it from my existence and my mind. I just thought, you know, I honestly thought Canadians, I'm Canadian. I thought that was like Canadian, um, Canadian white kids that I grew up with. Uh, that's what they would eat. Like, yeah. You know, well, also, and then like, you guys all have like cottages, right? Up there. <laughs> Not me, man. have a cottage or whatever. Yeah. You I might really want to talk about that at school. Cause I did like grade school years in Canada and all my classmates like, we're going to go to the cottage this weekend. I was like, why is it? And How can you afford a cottage? <laughs> well, also, I'd be like, when they would say a cottage, I would imagine like wood clogs in like Holland or something. I'm like, what are you talking about cottage? And then they would show me their cottage. I'm like, oh, it's just like a house that's like not here. Yeah, oh, it's okay. in the woods. Uh, Canadians love cottages, though. I'm loving Oh, you guys love them. You love a cottage. You just love a cottage. And I dig it. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Rachel and Dave, for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Man. And I love thank the film. I really, really do. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you did. Thank you.